So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Thanks for uh, attending. This uh, webinar is on revision management in the 3D Experience platform. Uh, my name is Bruce Schaller. I'm one of the senior applications engineers. I work out of the Santa Barbara office. If you need to contact me direct, the best way is probably in my email via bschaller at goengineer.com. So let's go ahead and get started. So hopefully you guys are all in listen-only mode. And again, you have questions, you can put them into the chat. And I should be able to see them from there. I will try to get to all the questions, but if uh, I can't get to them, I, you will see something via email coming in afterwards. I will try to answer them all. So to get started, if I was going to go show you revision management on the cloud with 3D Experience, uh, really and getting into specifically the different revision schemes is what this topic is about i really have to give you an introduction to the 3d experience platform because i would imagine most of the people on here haven't been on the platform and if you are there's going to be a lot of new things and some of those things might get introduced to you during these topics but everything that goes on to the platform ends up in a maturity state so you're going to have to learn some basics about life cycles uh, i want to show you it from a typical usage from you know the shoes of a user and a little admin i, I don't want to bore you on on this webinar so I, hopefully if you're on the west coast you've got a good sandwich in your hand and you're kicking back eating some lunch and, and getting some education along with it so we're going to do a little user little admin a little more on the user side. We're going to show you some stuff that's cloud-based. If you're putting everything on the cloud or on the platform, then you have the ability to do things that you might not be able to do, or you can do them in a certain way that you might not be able to do, and some of our typical PDM vaulting on-premise tools. So I wanted to show you that, along with some additional tool sets that allow you to collaborate with tasks that are built into your existing CAD system and the platform and show you how, how that type of feedback gets managed and streamlined. And also a little bit on just part numbering because this is a topic that generally everybody has to deal with at one point in time in their workflow. And so I'll show you a couple different ways that the uh, platform has to do with uh, part numbering. So it's just before we get started a little bit on Go Engineer and who Go Engineer is. I think y'all know we're the SolidWorks reseller. We're actually the number one SolidWorks reseller in the US and uh, that's not our only products though. We have Stratasys and the 3D Experience platform products, the Katia products that fall under that line, and a myriad of other products that are on this list. If you want to see more about these products, you can go to goengineer.com. We are nationwide now, so Anywhere that you're you know, coming on to this webinar from, we should be able to support you either you know, remotely or even on site or with a local office. So check it out. You can see where our local offices are on goengineer.com as well. But like our you know, Stratasys printer line, if you haven't jumped into some of the new cutting edge technology, we you know, also have a lot of that information online that you could go to on goengineer.com as well as our newer metal printers that Bello 3D, the very high-end metal printer, and Exact Metal. These metal printers are really good for tooling applications such as inserts for injection mold tools and such as things like that, little lower price metal solutions. In addition to our scanning solutions for large format scanners and measuring scanners and smaller format, very accurate scanners, so you can again go to goengineer.com for any of that. But we know what you guys are here for is to understand a little bit about what this rev management is on the platform and really how our 3D experience platform works. And in order to get started on that, I'm sure that the first questions that'll come in are if you don't have your SolidWorks connected to the 3D experience platform, how do you connect it to the 3D Experience platform. And you'll have to upgrade your existing 
SOLIDWORKS to include the 3D existing platform. Uh, the new announcement that's come out is uh, come July, all new purchases of SOLIDWORKS uh, perpetual license uh, will require two years of subscription and it'll come with the 3D experience platform uh, as well as what it's been coming for with before. So if you had SOLIDWORKS Professional and still come with the uh, same applications as before. In addition to what we're going to do with, uh, you know, today's seminar is I'm going to show you what you'll have to do to get started, at least put you in the right direction if you haven't done this already, which is our onboarding or jumpstart. So I'll cover a little bit of that at the end. So. The focus though today is really to start off with revision schemes. So what does the platform have to offer for revision schemes? We kept it pretty simple. We have a primary revision scheme. We have a primary and secondary revision scheme. So these are the two main revisioning schemes the platform has as of today. And both of these revision schemes uh, come with out of the box settings, so to speak. There is a third called primary and secondary using SOLIDWORKS as a master. This is a special case, and I'm not gonna cover this in this webinar. So our focus for today is gonna be again on primary. A real simple example of primary is I can go tell the platform when I put something in the platform to set a simple example, set it to A, go to B, C, D along the line, or numeric is in one, two, three. Now, if I set it to numeric or alpha, you can go ahead and you can tell the platform that you want it to start at one or zero. If you select alpha, you can go straight A, B, C, or you can start with a negative A, B, C. I think that it comes from government releases. And, and that scheme also skips the letters that look like numbers in the alphabet automatically for you. There's Nothing you need to do to set that, with the exception of setting that on there. So I'm gonna cover some of where these settings are and, and how to set them along the way. In this, the second revision scheme, and this is probably the most widely used one, is primary and secondary. In this format, the, the secondary revision displays after the primary revision. In other words, A.1, A.2, A.3 is gonna be the sequence of that formatting. The primary revision increments every time I create a revision from released content, from that sacred lockdown content. So it'll go ahead and, and bump the, the, the primary, such as the A to the B. The secondary revision resets to one. This, that identifies the major changes in the system. The secondary revision increments every time I create a revision from a non-released content. In other words, if I want to increment something in work or when it's frozen or that's allowed as far as my permissions are concerned, I could do that. And if, if I was doing that and I wanted to have an incremental revision, that's generally why I would do that. So a little bit better of an example with a primary and secondary would be that, you know, as I put something into the system, it goes into in work. I work on it. I might go ahead and, and along the way say, hey, give me a new revision. I like what I've got. I might want to go back to it a certain time. So go ahead and make it A2 as, as I go through any of these processes. And there, and this could be automatically or you know manually promoted or demoted based on you clicking on stuff like new revision in there. So Main reason again to use the primary and secondary revisioning scheme and probably why it's the most popular is to identify design iterations as you go along. So, and there are gonna be new revision schemes added as the platform gets updated quarterly. We are told the next release in June should have some more revision schemes, so that should be, should be announced. But I did want to say that because that's what we're being told right now. So going beyond that, before I jump into showing you how the platform works inside of SOLIDWORKS, uh, a little bit on maturity states, everything that I save to the platform does end up automatically in a lifecycle. It ends up in the in-work lifecycle. 
As you see, these are the lifecycle maturity states that the platform comes with out of the box. In general, you can change the name of them, but you can't add to these or take away from them with our connector product. So it keeps it pretty simple. And uh, that's the beginning of our you know, lifecycle maturity states. I'll get more into this as I show you how the product works. So to begin with, it's an add-on that works inside a solid weight, works the same way the add-ons work if we were using SolidWorks PDM. It's after you install it, if you're using this, your standard SolidWorks, it's the connector product. You can install it from the cloud with the connected product, but I'm using what we call the connector product where we're just taking our SolidWorks and bolting it onto the cloud. From there, it's just an add-on. We want the add-on checked at startup. And from there, I'm just going in and opening my product off my local hard drive. The same way I'd typically open it up if I did not have it saved to the cloud or saved in my vault. So after opening your product and having the add-on turned on, you're going to see that your session manager shows you what's in session. And if I hover over like the status of the file, it, it shows me it hasn't been saved to the 3D Experience platform yet. So there are a couple different ways I can save it to the platform. If I just right click, you can see expand and collapse. Those are pretty self-explanatory, but there's a couple other commands a new user would have to use. Learn, save, and save with options. If we went the traditional way to save it, we'd see a difference. It says save to this PC and there's a new command that says three, save to the 3D Experience platform. Anytime we see this, that's saving to the 3D Experience cloud platform. So in this case, I'll go ahead and use the file saved menu. Now, when I did this save, I put myself on a 4G network. So it's not going to be the fastest in the world, but it's somewhat equivalent to working on a, a PDM vault from home going through a software only VPN and maybe a couple other slower devices. When you first save to the cloud, depending on how many properties you have, particularly is the slowest time that you're going to see when you're using this product. And again, what, what we're being told is speed is one of the main things they're working on. So one of the initial check-in speeds I'm hearing are going to be a lot faster from start. But you can see right now, as I check it in, it goes ahead and it goes ahead and puts a revision on it. It goes ahead and puts it in work for me. It would populate any of the real properties that I'd want to see. And you can see one of the advantages of using the add-on for the cloud-based vaulting is it does put the information for your status of your file, whether it's locked or not, the revision of the file, everything that you really need to see right in the list, right next to the file. So that's kind of an added benefit to using our cloud base. You can really just look at that. But going back onto our session inside of SolidWorks and over into the task pane where a lot of our tools work from, I want to go through the process of just simply pushing this through the workflow of putting it into release. So what we're going to look at first is just changing the maturity state of just a single file. So I want to show you again, this is what our life cycle looks like. I have the option now to go in and make it private, to release it, or to go ahead and freeze it. I release it, that'll really lock down the file so it can't be changed in that released state. I might want to freeze it where it goes into an approval stage where people would come in and approve it. I want to keep it simple. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to take everything and check it in. You can see I can also see some of the properties like what collaborative space it's going to be checked into. The file name on the right is a little redundant. I've got it as my component names. So I can just snug that up and really look at taking everything and checking it in at once. 
or changing the maturity state of everything at once. So if I wanted to change the file, I would go in and lock it. But at this point in time, if I've really changed everything I want, and I just want to go in there and say, take all this data it's in the state that I want it, and I want to release it, I can go ahead and use things like the shift key or I can window files to go ahead and select multiple files. And I could go ahead and just go to the maturity state. Now you notice when I select multiple files that I don't get the typical lifecycle flowchart. It now comes in the list format because I've got multiple files selected. So I can go ahead and select released here to lock everything down. And that will take everything in the current rev that it was in and really lock that down into that released state in that revision format of the primary that I was giving it. So again here, if I went back in to the maturity state, depending on my settings for my platform, if I went back into something like the maturity state, or let's just go in this case, let's do a new revision. So I'm going to go through the process of, you know, I, I want to pull one of these out of being released and I want to do a new revision on it. So when I do that, what it automatically does is put it back to in work. It goes ahead and locks the file for me automatically because it, I checked it out and it wasn't already locked by someone else. So therefore, it locks it, assuming that I'm going to go make the changes to the file. This is where I would go make whatever changes I would want to make to the file. And then I would go ahead and check it back in or save it back in to the platform. So by pushing it back into released again, that's the same as you know saving it back to the platform in that released state. Now, I also could have elected to unlock it when I pushed it through that process or when I save it to the platform with options. I can do that and I'll show you that in a little bit. But what it's done here is it's actually caught that I have one file that also has changed at the top level, in other words, the assembly. And to update the assembly, I would essentially need to do the same thing. Go ahead and take it out of its released state by saying new revision. When I do that, it puts it back to in Word, locks the file for me. And at this point, I could really do anything I want if I wanted to. Add more files to my assembly before I go save it. I could do that. So I want to go ahead and, and unlock the files before I save them or after I save them. I can do that. Or I could even keep the files locked if I wanted to make sure that no one ever could work on them again until I unlocked them. But in this case, I just go ahead and push this product back through from the in work standpoint and push it back into released to the maturity graph. So that's just a basics on a primary and really just the primary revisioning. We'll go through and show you the primary and secondary and next. But before I get into primary and secondary, I know for some of the typical users out there that don't want to get into the admin, this might be a little boring for you, but it's just a couple minutes worth of getting into the platform. We go into our standard configuration page. This is where 90% of our configuration information exists, is under our Collaborative Space Configuration Center. And this is where we find our primary and secondary settings is under the lifecycle and collaboration area. There are only about four of these different distinct areas that we need to know about for connecting SOLIDWORKS to the cloud here, or to the 3D experience platform. So if I wanted to go primary and secondary and change it from primary, this is where I would set it, and I'd make sure that the green check would be checked at the side. 
I'm going to go in and look at some settings and some revision naming rules for some primary. So if I went into my revision naming rules, this is where we find what I want to set my SolidWorks product to. SolidWorks files are physical products. So I need to come down to the physical product area. And if I wanted it set to one, two, three, I can select the first setting on here. Like I said, alpha or numeric, these are my choices. If I want to start with the negative and eliminate the ones that look like letters, I would select the bottom selection here. I have mine set for primary. When I use primary, I generally use primary and secondary, but if I use primary, I just have it set to ABC. So there is something else that the platform can do as well. Look up here, we have document release. So that could be more of a Word file. So I have a different revision scheme that I can put into a Word document than I have for my CAD documents. In our PDM standard product, everything has to go through the same workflow. So whatever your workflow is for your CAD documents is gonna be your workflow for your Word documents or something. And here we can change that. PDM professional, you can, you can kind of do a little bit more with. So next, what we wanted to look at is the maturity graphs and under maturity graphs go into the engineering definition. This is where we find things like our transition rules that we might want to set. Now I've got an optional rule set that says to reject if a newer release exists. That way if somebody's pulled something out and frozen and started working on it before I released it, it wouldn't let me release it in there. So there's some other things we can do in here. We might want to allow things to change from maturity state from release to go back to indoor, but that would open up the platform for you know some people being able to walk on top of another file. So out of the box settings have very secure settings. So I can only go to obsolete or I have to do a new revision, which goes ahead and you know goes ahead and creates a new revision before putting it back to inward. In addition to these settings, I would say that if you go in and set your platform to primary and then want to change it, that every part that you put in inside of that had that primary when you first saved it the platform will stay with that primary revision scheme. So really this is something that you should set and have set correctly before you have everybody start utilizing the platform. If you changed it to primary and secondary, only the products that you put into the platform after that change is set is going to occur to those products. Anything that you put in utilizing the older revision scheme would stay to that revision scheme. So continuing forward, a little bit of a primary and secondary example, because this is really slightly different, and I'm trying to keep it super simple still here from the standpoint of kind of manually uh, demoting or promoting stuff from a uh, life cycle. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this the same way that I opened it before. It is slightly different named product in here. So doing it again for the first time, loading it off my disk. But rather than go into the save 3D experience platform, I'm gonna utilize the save with options this time. So we can go in and show you what some of the options are when you're saving to the platform for the first time. So one of the things that I can do is I can go ahead and select a bookmark. So that's like very analogous to a bookmark in your standard browser that you'd want to use so you could go back to the same website every time. Well, in this case, it's so you can easily bookmark projects. And when I bookmark that project, that bookmark shared with anybody else that logs into the platform via a normal browser that might not be using SolidWorks as well. So in addition, when I do the save with options, I could go in and do things like new revisioning if I wanted. I could also unlock files after saving in the lower corner, 
or give it a revision comment. I'm not doing any of that. I'm keeping it super simple and just saying bookmark this so other people will be able to see it in the bookmark on the platform as well. Bookmarks can be shared and I will go ahead and let it save to the platform and you can see with the primary and secondary revision, that revision scheme automatically gives it the A.1 when it's saved to the platform. Now, it also put it again in the life cycle state of in work. So let's go in and look at what I typically want to do if I was going to change the file. First off, I'd go in and lock the file that I wanted to make the change to. Then I'd go in and change the file, do whatever I wanted to the file, and either save the file back or go in and at one point, you know, tell it that, you know, I like it just where it is. I want to go ahead and do an incremental revisioning state. I want to leave A1 alone before I go make my change. So I'm going to go ahead and go in and say, give it a new revision. And that's what allows the revision bump to happen inside of in work. In other words, the secondary has changed the dot two. And again, just like in a primary state, it catches that there's a top level assembly that would need to be changed as well. So I can go through somewhat of the same process here, but in this case, I, I could just go ahead and save it. But again, if I would go in and just hit the save button, Look what the you know pop-up wizard's going to tell me. It catches me and it says, "Hey, the lock's required. Somebody else could have that lock too." And of course, it's not going to let me say. So these are the warnings that I'm going to get in just about any PDM vaulting system. It's going to do the same thing in here. It's going to catch that I didn't have that file locked. So how could I change it? So again, I can just go back in and lock the file, hit the save button, or lock the file and push everything back into a released state. So let's do that next. I'm going to go in and grab everything. And we'll go ahead and release this to Let me take the unlock off first, and then I'll go ahead and just do the multiple, you know, shift, select, and change everything in one selection again. When you do all the files at once, you're not going to get your little flowchart graph. Maybe I want to put something in frozen and get some approvals on something or get somebody to come in and start looking at it and making some comments or creating some, you know, collaborative tasks, which I'll show you next. But in this case, we're really just going to go in and, you know, say, take everything and push it to release. And so it'll take everything in that current rev state that it was in and push it to release. So from here, I really wanted to take it back out and I try to do it through the maturity graph. Look what happens because I didn't allow something to go from released. It can only go to obsolete. The only way I can take something out of released is to go in and say new revision. And when I do that, it's going to, of course, allow me to comment what my revision comment might be that lands in some rev table or in some comment section on properties on the platform. And this will go ahead and take it to that back in work state. And again, if you're running primary and secondary, what it's going to do is it's going to take everything from that release state that it's in and put it over into the next state, which would be the, well, in this case, our V1 going back into in work. So it's a Simple example, you can also see it shows up in the property manager here over here on the left as well. Again, that's kind of a benefit over some of our other vaulting tools, but that I like. So let's continue forward and look at it. There is another option that you get with the primary. 
and this one isn't usually used. Uh, the primary isn't really the, the number one option. I think primary and secondary are from a user standpoint. We like to see those incremental revs or have the ability to create them along the way, but we do have uh, enabled minoring revision. And without getting too deep into this, a simple example of this is it would go from A1, B1, C1. So I'm not really sure why somebody would use that, but there is another option under primary that really didn't cover. And I'm not going to go into in-depth because I don't have experience with this. So if you have questions on this, though, I can get them to the people that do. So some other little platform permission rules in here. And these are optional, but again, when you look at onboarding or our jump start, you'll have an AE dedicated specialist that can go through some of these settings with you, but you might want to change some of your out of the box settings, particularly when it comes to transition rules or permission rules. That's pretty much goes without saying and just about all vaulting software, but in this case, we might only uh, allow a revision to be minted from the release date. This can ensure that we don't have multiple old revisions that are in work in here. And again, these are things that we'd go in and take in or you know, take out of some settings inside the platform under permission rules. So let's go in and a couple other, this is more of a transition rule. And this is a life cycle that I took a snapshot where we open the system up. Maybe you're a single user using it and you want to be able just to change the maturity state at any time back from released to in work. You can allow that by, you know, creating this, you know, diagram that goes over back to in work. It's not something that would be suggested, but it would be an option that you can do just like a transition rule that you might want to add. So, this transition rule reject if newer release revision exists, ensures that an older revision doesn't get released in there. We'll get into a little bit of what older revisions are. Here's our bookmarks. So in this case, I have the ability to go log into my browser from really anywhere. I can use my uh, iPhone, you can use a Android and go to a browser when you're out at a restaurant could look and see what's going on. You could use the same search tools to find stuff. But in this case, I'm going to my bookmarks. And since I saved that file, I bookmarked it when I saved it. It's got a save bookmark to anybody that goes into that section of bookmarks on the platform. And if I went in on that section, I could see that somebody's, this isn't the latest file, that's the red X. I can go over there and even see who might be working on files. So this gives me some inner knowledge of what's going on with the file it's on the platform, meaning is there something being worked on? And is there something that's released? In this case, I can just create a real simple comment that anybody could see, or I could send it to somebody direct right at this comment stage just by you know adding their their name to it. So Back on the platform, I can see inside my task pane, I can see things like my session manager showing me my revisions and my maturity states, my property names, descriptions, status, stuff like that. I could go to the same search tool that I would use to find this on the platform. And I could drag and drop anything out of here into my session if I wanted. I can also show the bookmarks, the same bookmarks that I see that are on the platform, I can see the same app when I'm in my task pane. So a lot of the applications that work via a browser also work in my task pane, such as like collaborative tasks in here. So let's kind of take a look at it, the way some of these collaborative tasks work on the platform. But before I do that, I just want to cover a little bit about the search tool. So again, the search tool is something that we can use inside our task pane. And it's something that allows me to quickly go in and drag and drop any part 
that I might want and open it up from the platform. Previously, I was showing you something that I opened up off my hard drive and saved to the platform. But now that it's already saved to the platform, this is the easiest way to open it. If I wanted to, I could go to my browser and I could really utilize the same search in my browser as well. So we utilize this by utilizing these what, where, who, why type of tag solutions for filtering. So I could go in and filter my files done at a certain time. Where were they done? If you're on, you know, platforms that are across the you know, worldwide, so to speak, you might have certain things on one platform versus the next and want to search that. So some real advanced search functionality that's built into the platform, also built into the task pane inside of your SolidWorks. So beyond that, beyond using the task pane to go ahead and search on stuff, we want to get into collaborative tasks. So with collaborative tasks, I have in work, in complete, or I should say complete or uh, to do. And I can go in and let's just see how one of these work. If I was actually, you know, maybe sitting at a restaurant, and I wanted to go ahead and take a look at one of my workers' products, I could drag and drop it into our 3D Play or our 3D Markup application. Now with our 3D Markup application, it's pretty much a, a 3D Markup that works inside of our 3D Play. Think of 3D Play as kind of a, an e-drawings for the platform. And inside of this, we have capabilities when you have the login to use the markup app to go ahead and do the markups. Now, in this case, I'm going to say sync this part down into the housing. I'm going to cut and paste the same title as I did in the description. You could give it much more of a descriptive description if you want, but from here, I just want to go in and show you how to use some of the simple tools real quick for markups. You can kind of see I can go grab like a, a red line circle or I could go grab like an arrow tool and be specific about where I point it. And you notice that as I'm doing this, it's kind of updating my what kind of looks like a slide inside a PowerPoint. So I could snap a whole bunch of more slides under this one markup name, and they'd all be under this main markup. So if it takes one more than one snapshot for me to kind of get my point across, I could do that. In this case, I'm just going to keep it to one simple markup so I can show you what else we would do with this markup. The same collaborative task application that works inside the task pane inside of SolidWorks, of course, works on any browser. So I would have that up in my dashboard, and I would go ahead and take the markup that I named, and I would go ahead and add it to my collaborative task. And in the collaborative task area, you have an area to put attachments in. Now, what's kind of unique about this is I'm not zipping something from a hard drive into one file and using a file that goes outside of the system. I'm taking my, my markup and I'm just dragging and dropping it into my attachments area. If I wanted to, I could take my file that, you know, I don't, I don't know if the person knows what file I'm talking about or if they've got it up on their system right now or not. So I could just take the file and put it in the attachments. And again, this isn't packing and going an email outside of a system. This is all internal right into the cloud-based platform. So when I hit save here, what I would be doing from a SOLIDWORKS user, and I could assign this to other members too, since I'm doing it, I'm the member, I didn't really need to assign it to somebody, but I could assign it to a certain member, give it a priority, hit the save button, and then is the SOLIDWORKS user, if you know, I just sent it to myself and I'm the SOLIDWORKS user, I'm really gonna need to go in and to refresh my tasks to make sure I'm looking at the, the latest and greatest refreshed. And, when I refresh it, you can see there's my sync part down task. So there's ways I could go over and right click in the little caret menu and 
go in and edit the task or assign it to the course myself. And uh, it's already assigned to myself. And I can come down and look at, well, there's the markup. So if I wanted to, I can preview that markup right in the 3D play inside my browser or inside my task pane. Or I can click and say, hey, show me that one kind of PowerPoint slide. And let me see if I can get the idea from that. So I could quickly click through all the PowerPoint slides that I would have had under that one single markup. Or I can go ahead and just drag and drop the file over that they were talking about. And I'm assured that I'm going to be working on the file that they were just putting the red line on, no matter what, because it is linked to all the same data on the platform. It's not an external email. So at this point in time, I could change it from to do to put it in work. There's also percentage of completion done and stuff that gets more into the process management of the PLM on the platform. Kind of goes beyond the typical, you know, PDM system. But from here, I just kind of want to go in and look at really one last thing before we start wrapping it up here. And I look at some of the questions, which is our in browser part numbering and property management. This is pretty much the same on you know all vaulting systems where you have properties that get mapped to the platform. In this case, the platform maps your configuration specific properties. You can see I'm using some stuff for tolerance block data and some enterprise part numbering stuff that we'll get to in a sec. But it's basically properties that you would see also in your task pane, or if you went to the properties command on the platform, you have access to adding, editing, or changing any of the properties that exist that are in your templates, so to speak. So looking at properties here and changing them is one way, and that's really the recommended way if you're using the platform is just do everything from the right-click properties on the platform. It just makes one consistent area to do it. Although if you do it in one area, it syncs to the other. So getting into part numbering, this is one area that the platform has an advantage on top of PDM standard. PDM standard, you have to do part numbering manually. It doesn't come out of a sequential database and you can't go format the database like you can in PDM professional. So inside the platform, we can make it so we can tell it how many digits we want, the format of the digits, and even start it off with something like GOE for it was a GOE part number or something. And that's automatic. That's one way of doing the automatic part numbering. But we have something that goes above and beyond that. We have enterprise part numbering. And with enterprise part numbering, we can use this to shift select and select a whole bunch of parts at once any time in the process and you can see this is a command you'd go down and use down at the bottom it's not in your right click it looks like the barcode and if i wanted to just do one part at a time i could have clicked on one part or went to the little carrot on the right but i wanted to do all the parts at once so what this is allowing me to do is once i really know that this part's gone to the point where it's going to need a part name i can go ahead and stamp it with a part name and in, in my case, it has some semi-intelligence to it. It looks at parts coming from a mechanical part template, and it goes ahead and makes it a mechanical part MCP. And it just makes the next sequential number in my database as I work on it. And you can kind of see that is one of the advantages of working with the PLM system, and meaning the platform is a lifecycle management system. So we can do some advanced property stuff that. I could have a template for uh, an assembly, a template for an electronic part. And when I go in and start making part numbers, it makes, you know, windowing, shifting and selecting and putting all the right part numbers there that much easier. So part number and property management on the platform comparative to PDM uh, can be a step up. It's pretty nice. Although PDM professional can do some pretty high end part numbering, it really requires some out-of-the-box programming where this one really does not. So let's look at a couple other CAD connector versus the PDM uh, platform. 
in the CAD connector is really the application name we give it to that vaulting inside of SolidWorks. In other words, everything that you saw on the platform and the, and the uh, task pane inside of SolidWorks is what the connector is all about. So if we look at that, you know, saving this to the cloud, you don't have to buy a server. You don't have to maintain the server. You don't even have to plug the server in and power it. You know, you never have to manage it from a long-term standpoint, nor do you need to do the backups. That's all being done for you securely on the cloud. So exploring design structures, doing this from anywhere, from almost any browser. I'm going to say I've tried three browsers. All three of the browsers I've tried work. I'm sure there's browsers that don't out there and there's devices that don't. But for the most part, from most of the typically used browsers, you can get to that. And of course, you can get to that and do different things. Didn't really show you the filtering and review, but I did show you the search. I could have gone in and searched and said, hey, under the search, show me all the make or bought parts and make them in different colors. So maybe all the uh, buy parts are in yellow and the make parts are, are in blue or something in there. So just another way of looking at stuff. And that could be all done through a browser on the platform as well just like my digital markups where, where I could go in and mark something up, you know, sitting at a restaurant, being at a bar, making a task, assigning that task to somebody and, you know, having that person that's all in SolidWorks get that task right inside their task pane. So all in one organized area. And of course, a little bit on that part numbering and shift selecting and letting it have a part number when you need it. So. On top of all this, we have what I've talked about is onboarding and jumpstart. Putting you into the platform successfully quick. And what this is all about is really, we, we want, want to help you lay out what's going to be your templates that everybody's going to use. Some of those transition settings and permission settings that might be, you know, a, a correct setting for somebody that has more users than less users we do have different onboard services we have self-serve onboarding where you can go to my solidworks and you know when you log into the platform and connect the platform to the solidworks you will get a lot of training videos on there we do have some onboard self-training coming soon from go engineer so look for that under our training session but we also have our applications mentoring sessions. You can get people like me on for an hour to help you out if you didn't pay for the onboarding services and you tried to do this yourself. This really entails taking and mapping your properties to the platform correctly, let alone giving you some advice on the platform. A lot of our platform onboarding services really comes down to training. So I'd even say 60% uh, of of our onboarding services is really training uh, the end users and uh, an administrator on setting up the platform and daily usage. Then we also have an enterprise implementation plan for it's for a, the bigger companies that you know are going to have more of a, of a I would say a non out of the box implementation. Let's say so. Ask your sales rep for a quote on that if you're in, in that situation, but from there, let me just go in and see what we've got in questions. So, any questions? Make sure that I'm. Yep. Any questions about pricing that I'm seeing come up? I would say that. Uh, that you really need to talk to your sales reps, but in the, in the future, uh, paying for subscription service is probably gonna bring you into the tool along with new purchases. Uh, they're gonna have included with the tool in the future, come July from what I'm told, June, July. So uh, look for that, but I would say that is a good question for your sales rep. So text, email, or uh, call your sales rep on that. Any other questions coming in? Yeah. 
that really does it, you guys. Thanks for uh, participating and uh, hope to see you in our next session.